we're going to look at applications of second order ODEs, specifically spring problems. We're not going to look at damping, and we'll do that in a little bit, but right now, not, because that's going to add difficulty. If you're a physics person, this treatment might bother you a little bit because this is more of a math treatment, but we're all going to still get the same answer, so we should just be happy and be quiet about it. All right, so basically the idea is you have a spring, and hopefully by the time you're taking DPQ, you understand that springs have constants, spring constants. So spring constant is basically an indication of how easily it stretches, stretchiness, and um, basically Hooke's law says that the more you stretch something, uh, the more it resists stretching. So basically the idea is that the force of a spring is given by negative k, we'll just call this x, basically that if I have this springy thing and I smoosh it way up here, so if this is kind of like my coordinate system, x is positive, but the force is pointing down, so that's why we say negative kx. And if my spring is way down here, and it's super stretchy, even though x is negative, or you can't even see what I'm doing anymore, it's so negative, even though x is negative, it's pushing up. So again, that the force is the opposite of x, so that's why we say the force caused by the spring is negative kx, kind of like that. Got it? Okay. Now, at any given time, all the forces that are going to be on this mass or whatever are going to be the spring force. So this is the spring force. The spring force, um, some kind of a resistive force. So this would be resistive, like damping, but we're going to pretend that that's not there for the moment. And then any other external forces that may be on there. Make sense? Okay, so we're gonna plug in some of these values. We've got the sum of the forces is equal to, the spring force is negative kx, we have the resistive force, and then we have some external forces. Now, we're gonna pretend that this is zero for the moment and be super happy. Now again, this is our um, equivalent, uh, blah, blah, blah. with no mass, we have no mass going on right now, so we're kind of working off of this, uh, this unit little system right there. Okay, Ooh, I dropped my x. <laughs> so negative kx plus some non-existent resistant force. Now, I know because of physics <laughs> that the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. So this is cos of physics. So I've got negative kx plus some external forces, and it'll be gravity, obviously, in a little bit, is equal to mass times the double derivative position, because I know the double derivative position is acceleration, and again, this is because of physics. So what happens if, well, I go ahead and solve this side, mx double prime plus kx is equal to all the external forces. Make sense? Okay, now, at any given time, we can say, well, let's go ahead and put a mass on the spring. So if I put mass on the spring, then that means that any kind of, um, how do I say it? Well, basically that I have an additional external force. So we'll say if, let's see, if we add a mass to the spring, then, so if we add a mass, that's gonna result in another external force, which would be gravity, mass times gravity. Now, for our purposes, to make things easy, so we're going to call g is either going to be 9.8, and I know we usually use 9.81, but this is more of a math treatment anyway. Like I said, if you're a physics person, you'd be mad, at least I didn't call it 10. 9.8 meters per second, or 32 feet per second, just because I'm doing a lot of these problems by hand, and it's better not to have the extra stupid decimal point, like that. Okay, so now we've added some mass. Okay, actually, I'm going to come back up here. Now, what's important to note is that if there's nothing going on if there's no movement. So if, um, so this is our, our force, so I could say if, uh, if we're in equilibrium, then the sum of the forces is actually zero, okay? Because it's not moving, because acceleration is zero, because it's not moving. So if we're in equilibrium, then we look at the sum of the forces, they were minus kx, plus now mg and some other, well, there can't be any other external force if it's going to be in um, equilibrium, 
and that's going to equal zero. Now in this particular case, I know that the amount that is stretched is actually delta L because that's Hooke's law, the amount that stretches that. So I can say that um, negative k, I'll just say k delta L is equal to mg. So this is actually something I can use all the time. That if I know how much the spring is stretched in equilibrium, then that can give me the k value. So I'll go ahead and write that out. There we go. Now what's kind of fun about this, <laughs> you're like, what could get better, is I can actually come up to this original equation or this original picture and I can say, you know what, rather than measuring my equilibrium from this gray line, let's pretend that I'm going to use this coordinate system instead. All right. So if I call this original coordinate system x, because that's what I was using, I can actually translate everything over to this little x tilde coordinate system. So I'm actually measuring. So from now on, I can say I'm going to measure from where it is in equilibrium after it's stretched. So whenever I do that, then, oops, let me make sure you see this while I do this, I can say that x tilde is going to be whatever x was and then minus delta L, okay? Because if I have x and then I move delta L down, I'll end up at x tilde. So I'm going to work with that. I have that x tilde is equal to x minus delta L. And then if I take the derivative, since this is a constant, it goes to zero. Do, 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 like that. Good. Now I can go ahead and plug it back into this equation up here. So I have that m x tilde double prime plus k, and then x would be x tilde plus delta L. This is going to be equal to my external forces plus mg. Apparently writing really small today. So I have m x double prime plus k x to do plus k delta L is equal to external forces plus mg. It's another external force. And fancily enough, I know that this is a good substitute for this. So I can m x tilde do do plus k x plus mg f external mg, which means that these are going to go away. And I have a nice little thing that, or equation, that relates acceleration and the spring constant to any external forces I may have. Now most of the problems that I'm actually going to look at are going to be zero um, external forces, but it's nice to have that in there just in case. So basically the idea is if I have a spring and it tells me how much it's stretched in equilibrium, I can find its k, and then I can describe the motion using this second order differential equation. So now you might say, please, please, pretty please, can I practice these newfound skills? And the answer is, of course you can. I would love to oblige. So here's a sample kind of a problem where basically you have an object stretching a spring a certain distance. You want to describe the motion. There's no damping involved, so we can use our, our little thingy that we just came up with. And then after that, um, there's an initial value problem you can solve. So to get started, first it's important to notice that this stupid problem is already trying to trick us. Here's things in feet, here's things in inches, and here's things in inches. Now. Whenever we're going to solve these, we're going to probably need to use a value of g, and the g that we have is in feet per second, which means that we want to turn this 18 inches into 1.5 feet. And we want to change this 6 inches into 1 half of a foot. Like. Now, it doesn't give us the k value of the spring, but we can calculate that because we know that in equilibrium that the delta L times k is going to be equal to mass times gravity, the pull of gravity. So delta L is one half of a foot, M we don't know, but G we know is 32. So we can say that K is 64 times M, which is good. So we're going to take that information and then put together our equation. So we had MX double prime plus KX is equal to external forces, but we're not given any, so we can just call that zero. So m double prime, x double prime plus 64. And then make sure you note that that m is like an m for mass and not an m for meters. If I was actually typesetting this, it would look like 64 script m because, you know, variables are italicized. That would be ma um, mass, unknown mass. Um, if I did like 
this, that would clearly be 64 meters if I was typing it, but since I'm not typing it, you just have to remember. So that k of x equals zero. Beautiful. Now those m's are going to go away because I'm assuming a non-zero mass, otherwise it's kind of silly. So I have x equal prime plus 64x equals zero, which is great because this is just a normal, ordinary, second order, constant coefficient, differential equation. So I can write a characteristic equation of r squared plus 64 is equal to zero. So that means r is equal to plus or minus 8i. And because I've gotten super good at this, that means that I can generally describe the motion as some unknown a times the cosine of 8t plus some unknown constant b times the sine of 8t. So there's a nice equation for general motion. Fantastic. The second part of the problem, though, says that we want to solve the initial value problem. And again, this is just an issue of how well can you read the problem and convince yourself what the initial conditions are based on what it says. So this is our initial displacement is 1.5 feet above equilibrium. So that means that at time equals zero, we're at a positive 1.5 feet. Then the initial velocity is 3 feet per second downward. Velocity is the first derivative of position, and it's downward. So this is really all we have to do. So in order to apply my initial conditions first, I'm going to take a derivative. So I'll have that, and then I need a little bit more room. So I've got negative 8a. You're going to get really good at taking derivatives of sines and cosines if you're not already. 8b cosine 8t. All right, and I know that x at 0 is 1.5. Cosine of 0 is 1, sine of 0 is 0, so a equals 1.5. x prime at 0 is negative 3. Sine of 0 is 0, 8b, so b equals negative 3 over 8. So that means that I have a final solution of x is equal to 3 halves. I'm just writing it that way because it's pretty. Cosine 8t minus 3 eighths sine of 8t. Now this is all well and good. I'm going to go ahead and graph that just to give you an idea of what's going on. Okay, so here's what it looks like when you graph it. And it basically looks like an altered sine or cosine wave. Now I can confirm that I've at least got some general ideas. So I can say, well, what is the value at x equals 0? Because it should be 1.5. Excellent. Um, I'm going to go ahead and find the maximum so I can find the total height or the amplitude of this curve. So the amplitude of this curve is something 1.55. So, and it shifted over a little bit. So the idea is my graph looks kind of like this. Okay, so it does intersect at 1.5, but it has a maximum at 1.55 just to the left a little bit. So it shifted over just a slight amount. Now, this is important because you actually see as you follow the graph that the first thing that do, it it's doing is it's going down. So its derivative is negative, which makes sense because we said the first thing we did was, you know, initial displacement or initial um, velocity, we threw the mass down. So the graph is very much corresponding to what we expect it to do. Now, of course, the problem is it's very, very hard to tell what this equation is doing just by looking at it. So there's actually another format about how you can modify or display this kind of information, and it's called the phase amplitude form. And so that's something I'm going to do in another video.